Hello everyone, this is going to be 5.3, The War of 1812, and we're going to start with a primary source from John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. Get used to this guy's name, you're going to hear from him a lot. And he said, I believe that in four weeks from the time a declaration of war is heard on our frontier, the whole of Upper Canada and a part of Lower Canada will be in our power. He thought that as soon as we declared war on England, Canada would run to join the United States. Uh, he was incorrect. Our objectives, we are going to identify the events that led to the Warhawks, that's a group uh, calling for war against England. We are going to analyze the major battles and conflicts of the War of 1812 and explain the significance of this war that most people don't really remember very well. So last class we talked about Jefferson, we talked about the Embargo Act, um, and uh, after two terms Jefferson stepped down, precedent, and James Madison was elected. Madison was a Democratic Republican. He was uh, he had helped to write the Federalist Papers, but now he was uh, a firm believer in smaller government. So here's our fourth president, uh, James Madison, president from 1809 to 1817, from Virginia. He was a delegate to the Confederation Congress. He was a congressman, uh, and he was Secretary of State under Jefferson. He's also our smallest president. He was about five foot four. His wife was five foot seven. Uh, and he weighed just about 100 pounds soaking wet. So he was he was a little tiny president. He was a carry-on bag president. Now, let's look at how he got to the War of 1812. What caused it? Well, after the embargo, Democratic Republicans needed to change economic course to stop the English from taking our ships. They set up what's called the Non-Intercourse Act, which said that we were setting up um, embargoes against Britain and France specifically and not the entire world, which is what the Jeffersonian embargo was. So we were uh, specifically pointed at those two countries. The year after this, we passed a law saying, that, hey, we are, we are willing to trade with whatever country is the first to recognize uh, American neutrality, and guess who got there first? That would be France. So France is now our ally, and we are trading with them. England is not our ally. We are embargoing England. Meanwhile, in the West, we are having trouble with Native Americans. There are two Shawnee brothers who are trying to unite Native American tribes uh, to fight against the Americans and preserve their own territory. This is called Pan-Indianism. Uh, and so these two guys are Tenskwatawa, better known as the Prophet, and his brother Tecumseh. And they were basically tired of the government encroaching on their land, um, the broken promises of uh, the American government, and they were using guns that were given to them by the British. And so the British were sort of agitating the natives um, on our western frontier uh, and, and sort of enabling them. And so this angered America more against England. Uh, eventually, the governor of the Indiana Territory, William Henry Harrison, would lead troops into battle against the brothers at the Battle of Tippecanoe, which made Harrison a nationwide celebrity. So this is going to be important when Harrison runs for president. You notice that he is called Old Tippecanoe. Uh, that's his sort of war nickname that they used when he ran for president. And so here are Tecumseh and the prophet, uh, who once said, Show respect to all people, but grovel, meaning beg, to none. Now, in 1811, a group of mainly young southern and western politicians started calling for war with England. These guys were not alive, or were very young at least, when uh, we fought England in the American Revolution. So they are new to the scene. Um, and they got the nickname the War Hawks for doing this. They were sort of the next generation of American leaders, and they were very warish towards England. Uh, their leaders were guys like Henry Clay of Kentucky and John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. And they thought that we should attack Great Britain, and the best way to do this would be by attacking and taking over Canada, which they thought would be done in a cakewalk. So here's Henry Clay. Uh, we're going to see him a lot in the next couple chapters, 1777 to 1852. He was from Virginia, but spent most of his life in Kentucky. He was a congressman and a senator and secretary of state under John Quincy Adams. Uh, one of the Warhawks, and he ran for president three times, but never won. And he said, Sir, I would rather be right than president. And he may have been right occasionally, but he was never president. So let's look at war with Great Britain. We'll get to Calhoun later on. 
uh, because of the impressment of our sailors, uh, the taking of our sailors and our ships, uh, the fact that the British were arming the Native Americans, uh, eventually Madison was forced to declare war on England uh, in 1812. And it was a very close vote. Uh, not everybody was in favor of this war, but it became the War of 1812, and it divided the country along party lines. Uh, this was a war fought by Democratic Republicans and opposed by Federalists. Uh, and Madison barely eked out a hold on the White House for another four years after this. Now, America had 8 million people. Canada had only 250,000. Um, they thought that we would take Canada in like a day or two. However, that turned out not to be true. Uh, America didn't really have an army, not a professional one. Uh, both Madison and Jefferson thought that, well, we'll do what we did in the American Revolution. Uh, whenever we have to fight a war, we will call up the militia, they will take their guns off the mantelpiece and go into battle and win the whole darn thing. Uh, it turned out that it was a lot harder than that. So we went up to Canada and we lost big time. We actually attacked Canada three times and lost three times. So uh, don't underestimate the Canadians is the rule of the day in 1812. Now, uh, what we did do well was our navy. Uh, our small navy on the Great Lakes actually did pretty all right. Uh, we beat the much larger British navy, uh, opening our way for our army to capture the uh, city of Detroit. Uh, we were not able to take Canada, but we did uh, at least beat the Native Americans. So William Henry Harrison's army killed Tecumseh in 1813, and a newcomer, Andrew Jackson of Tennessee, defeated uh, tribes in Alabama and Florida. Um, where he defeated the Seminoles. So here's General Andrew Jackson. The War of 1812 is going to make him a hero. And he once said, Peace above all things is to be desired, but blood must sometimes be spilled to obtain it on equable and lasting terms. We'll see much more of Andrew Jackson at the end of this chapter. Now, for the, mo for the first part of the War of 1812, the British had mainly been fighting Napoleon in Europe. They, you know, the, the war in America was basically an expensive sideshow. Uh, however, in 1814, they finally defeated Napoleon Bonaparte, and they could give us their undivided attention, and boy, were they ever so happy to see us. They blockaded our ports, they attacked our towns uh, all up and down the East Coast, and actually marched into Washington, D.C., and burned most of it down. So, here's the uh, British attack on the East Coast. We'll see a little bit more of that in a second with Baltimore. But this is the British burning the White House. They marched in, they had Madison's dinner after he fled, and they burned down the White House. You can still see the, the char marks on the side of it. Now, after burning D.C., they moved to Baltimore, where they thought that they would win another easy victory. However, um, this ended up being a much more difficult fight for them. Um, the uh, victory in Baltimore at a place called Fort McHenry showed that the Americans wouldn't go out without a fight. And the Battle of Fort McHenry was witnessed by a guy named Francis Scott Key uh, on board an, uh, an English ship uh, where he uh, wrote a poem called The Star-Spangled Banner. And eventually it uh, became a song which eventually became our national anthem, but not until the 1930s. We didn't have a national anthem until the 20th century. So here's the Battle of Fort McHenry with our flag flying above it. And here is the actual Fort McHenry flag, still at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Now, let's look at the impact of this war. In January of 1815, America won our biggest victory at the Battle of New Orleans. Um, Andrew Jackson, with the help of some local volunteers, including a few pirates, uh, pushed out the British with the loss of only 71 of his own men. This was a huge victory for uh, Jackson. Weirdly enough... This victory came after the, the peace treaty had been signed. However, it's just that nobody in America knew about it because it was the peace treaty was signed in Belgium, and it took a couple weeks for the uh, treaty to make it to America. But uh, this made Jackson a national hero and was sort of the victory that we needed at the end of the war. So here is the Battle of New Orleans with Andrew Jackson atop this sort of bulwark right there. In the war, America had not captured Canada. Britain had not captured the United States. The Treaty of Ghent basically said, okay, everybody back to your sides. Uh, everybody, everybody go back to what the way things were before the war. However, Napoleon was gone, so the British didn't try to steal any more of our sailors. And so America thought, you know, that counts as a victory. So uh, we say that we won the War of 1812. It was more of a draw, really. 
Probably the biggest loser of the war, though, was the Federalist Party, who had been opposing the war. Uh, some even met to talk about possibly breaking away, called seceding from the United States, maybe making a separate peace with Great Britain, um, at least asking for more political power for New England. And unfortunately for them, uh, the, the Hartford Convention uh, demands came out at the same time that uh, the Battle of New Orleans was fought. And so it looked like the uh, Federalists were just kind of whiners and traitors, and uh, this more or less spelled the end of the Federalist Party. Um, and so uh, this was the time where the Federalist Party just up and left. So the party of Washington, Adams, and Hamilton was gone by 1820. Uh, and we will see they will be later replaced by other parties. The other big takeaway from the War of 1812 is that most Native Americans sort of gave up the fight at this point, at least for the moment, uh, east of the Mississippi River. Uh, this led to the establishment of many states in the, east, in, uh, in, in the West, including Indiana, Mississippi, Illinois, and Alabama. Uh, Missouri is going to enter in 1821. Uh, also, Americans were moving into places like Florida, and eventually Spain gave us Florida, or we bought Florida, in uh, what's called the adams onis Treaty of 1819. So this is what America looks like in 1820. We are expanding at this point. 